Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Tomplay. of acts of violence or that are of a sexual nature. It should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. The facts we're retelling you were presented to us by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My description of the crime scenes or what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. In today's episode, I'm going to tell you all about what you didn't hear on the news or read in the newspaper about what happened in court yesterday on Courtney Coco's murder trial. But before I start with that, I want to talk to you. This will be the last time y'all hear it. I want to talk to you about the crew bash. June 19th at the Texas Club, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is the second annual Real Life Real Crime crew bash and y'all if you made it last year you know it was a great time this year's gonna be much improved and the doors will open at 7 p.m and i'm going to take the stage probably about 7 45 something like that and i'm gonna do a live never before heard podcast crowd interactive and it's gonna be a good one you don't want to miss it okay And then after the podcast, we're going to be doing the drawing for the Louisiana Oregon Procurement Agency in which Captain Calvin Duvall of Duvall's Cajun Charters has donated a fishing trip for the winner and a guest to fish with me and him for a day down in Delacroix, Louisiana, and y'all, his stuff is all top notch. He's the best guy, period. And I fished with a lot over the years. And added to that, drawing real life, real crime is going to pay to put the winners up for the lodging the night before. And I'm gonna come down the night before. Also, we can hang out, drink a beer, have a few laughs, tell a few stories. And then the next morning, wake up at the crack of dawn, and we're on the boat tearing up the fish, right? When we get done, Captain Duvall's services, he's full service, y'all. He has all the top of the line equipment and the knowledge. But when he gets in, he actually cleans the fish and packages them for you. And to put your fish in, you're going to have a brand new, the winner will have a brand new 125-quart Yeti ice chest donated by Jim Chapman and the Local Leaders Podcast. Y'all, that's over 600 bucks just for that ice chest alone. And the tickets are $15 for one, or you can get a book of 10 for $100. Now, there's a second place winner. Another Yeti 125-quart ice chest donated by Home Key Mortgage and Miss Tiffany Sicard. So... 
you got double the chances of winning, right? Somebody's going to win the grand prize and somebody's going to win that, that awesome second Yeti donated by Home Key Mortgage. So, again, you can get those tickets by going to realliferealcrime.com, go to the merchandise store, and they're there for sale. So get them. That We are going to sell them right up, including at the Crew Bash. And after I get done with the podcast, we're going to take the stage, Captain Duvall, Jim Chapman, and I, and Miss Tiffany Sicard, and we're going to draw the winners, y'all, and we'll present the check to Lopa, or Lopa's representative, Lori Steele, live and on stage at the Texas Club. So you don't want to miss that. But the night's going to get better. When I get off the stage, I'm going to go have a spot, designated spot set up, and I'm going to sign autographs and take pictures with everybody that wants one. I'll be there doing that. But meanwhile, the Chase Tyler Band, Louisiana Country Music Hall of Fame inductee times two in Y'all, they you know, they have a hot single out right now of Garth kind of night. But they're going to perform a concert, and it's a concert, y'all. The Texas Club, the venue, it was made for concerts. It's not a bad place in the house. The sound system's going to be phenomenal. The light show's going to be phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's going to be a great time. And when I get done signing autographs and and taking pictures, and I'm, I'm going to be drinking the whole time, y'all, including on stage. But I'm going to hang out with everybody until they make us go home. Now, I'm saying, and a lot of lifers, we got kind of lifers coming in from all over the country, y'all. And I talked to one of them today that's come from Tennessee to Georgia and Georgia to Baton Rouge, driving in with her significant other. But we have them coming in from all over the country, Colorado, uh, you just name it, they're coming. But I got a room deal at the Hilton, the Capitol Hilton in downtown Baton Rouge. Uh, if you want to stay where we're going to stay, I'm going to be there Friday night and Saturday night. If you want to stay there, we got a great rate for the rooms. And when you, if you book it online, you punch in the code RLRC and it gives you your discount. And if you book it on the phone, it just tell them you're there for real life, real crime. And it's important. I know the people that are going to be staying with us. We got a little surprise for y'all, also. So it's going to be a great time. It's a great event. You can get your tickets at Eventbrite.com. And when you go to Eventbrite.com, just type in "real life, real crime" and it'll bring it up. They're forty dollars a piece, y'all. That's forty dollars for seven o'clock until closing time worth of entertainment. So it's it's uh it's going to be a hell of a show in. If you were there last year, we had people hanging off the rafters. The Texas Club is is much larger. It's almost three times the size of the venue that we played last year, and we sold it out. Now, the Texas Club, we had sold it out when the governor had restrictions on on the crowd size. We still have some tickets left, but I promise you they won't be left by, by next weekend. And don't call me. Last year, I had so many people call and message me, you know, like, two days before, hey, Woody, can you get us a ticket? Can you get us a ticket? I can't, y'all. Once we reach our, our maximum, that's it. Fire marshal, code, et cetera. Real quick on some life stuff. Like, you know, the lives in the past I did, y'all, we sold them all out. It's just a fact. And on the first ones that we did, Buddy's Barbecue, I think I mentioned it before, and there's a reason I'm telling you this. The Buddy's Barbecue, which is located in Denham Springs, Louisiana, oh, my God, their food is phenomenal. The, how I got introduced to them is Mickey, the owner, Mickey Watson, he is a huge lifer, and he catered our first live shows for free. And, and you know, it's it's all the best barbecue you can eat, ribs, the brisket. Oh, my God, the brisket's to die for you name it, sausage, uh, a pulled pork, everything is just absolute fire. And the the sides, oh, we got the beans, the homemade mac and cheese, the potato salad, the coleslaw, you know, anything you can imagine. He's got it, sweet potatoes. But the, I never properly thanked him. And last week I was doing um, some uh, photo shots for – the lifers for me to sign at the bash at, at Jim Chapman's Envision Studio uh, podcast studio where he does local leaders. 
and we got to talking about Mr. Mickey at Buddy's Barbecue. So Cindy and I left from there, and we went to get some barbecue. Got to meet Mickey for the first time in person, and y'all, he, we sat down for almost an hour and talked, and I mean, just a great guy, great food, great sides, everything, but let me tell you something, I am a, I am a boudin and crackling connoisseur. Now, if you don't know what a crackling is, you're from outside of Louisiana, it's like where they take the pork bellies and they cube them up, and true, not pork skins, cracklings, so the true cracklings have the meat on the bottom of them, And Mickey said he made his own smoked cracklings. Now, I never had that my entire life, but he gave me some, oh, my God, y'all, to die for in a barbecue sauce, a crackling, and it's smoked, and and his seasonings, phenomenal. But another big thing he does is catering. And for any kind of events, he's he's a a multi, multi multi-time winner for different barbecue a contest in Memphis and different places. I mean, this you know, this isn't just somebody decided he wanted to barbecue. He's been doing it for years and years and years and years. And he has the portable rigs. He can go anywhere and do the you know your events, your weddings, or they do it small. So I think they cater for like ten people. You can have your office lunch catered. And look, the prices are good, but the food is even better. And so I just you know we established a relationship with him, and I'm going to be talking about him in the future. And look, he can ship. The, the barbecue to certain meats, but you, you can, you know, call him or y'all look him up. It's Buddy's Barbecue, Denham Springs, Louisiana. Great people. And he loves real life, real crime, and we love him. And he said, if you're a lifer, you come in his store and you get your meal, tell him that you're a lifer and real life, real crime sends you and he's going to give you a free drink too. So Mickey, we really appreciate you and, and thanks for taking the time with us the other day. Your food is amazing, y'all. And so we'll be talking more about Mickey and uh, Buddy's Barbecue, y'all. Buddy's Barbecue, Denham Springs, Louisiana. It's on Facebook. You can Google it. It's just phenomenal. All right. That being said, Crew Bash, get those tickets. They're going to be gone in me. And Chase Tyler, we're going to rock the house. And then somebody's going to win some great gifts with all proceeds going to benefit LOPA, Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. And y'all know how I feel about that. All right, long enough on that. Just want to say it's the last commercial for the Crew Bash because by the time you hear the next episode after this one, and this one may run too far, but if you when you hear the next episode, it'd be too late. It, uh, that'd be the morning of the Crew Bash. So that's it. All right, so I'm going to tell you what happened yesterday. I didn't know how to do this. I went to court because I told Miss Stephanie that I was going to be there, and I have been for every single one of them. And thank you, patron members, for your continued support and allowing me to financially be able to do that. But yesterday was set for motions, and they had the defense, the defense attorney, LaCour, filed for a motion for preliminary exam. He filed for a bond reduction. He filed for the, what they call in Louisiana the Bill of uh, p- uh, Particulars to be read, basically. And I'll explain it to you. First of all, the preliminary exam, y'all, you've heard me talk about it so many times. That's where the defense actually gets to get the cop on the stand and find out everything they have in their entire case. And then they try to get the judge to throw it out, okay? The bond reduction, that's self-explanatory. The motion on the Bill of Particulars, I mean— you know, that means they want, because it was done by a grand jury, they want it read uh, on, you know, what it is that the charges were for. And, and so nobody thought anything was going to happen yesterday. First of all, preliminary exam is not going to happen. You know why? Because David Anthony Burns was indicted by a grand jury, period. That That's means a grand, a jury of his peers found more than probable cause and to indict him for second-degree murder of Courtney Coco. Fact. So that was a waste of time. The bond reduction I'm going to get into, but uh, and the bill of particulars, y'all, you know, I'm going to get into all that in a minute. Let me, let me play you what came out on the news last night, and yeah, but... And then I'll get into what happened yesterday because I know I'm skipping around, but you know I'm raw and unscripted. So let me play this for you. 
Switching gears here in Alexandria, David Anthony Burns, he's the man accused of killing Courtney Coco back in 2004, was back in court today attempting to reduce his bond. It's part of that detective, uh, to Tanner Dryden took the stand, revealing that Burns was arrested almost 17 years after the murder when the detective located a witness over in Texas who claims he saw Burns backing out of the building where Coco's body was later found. Dryden stated that Burns was first named as a suspect back in 2011 after telling three people that he was involved in Coco's death. He says at the time... There was no other evidence to arrest Burns on until the witness was found. That witness claims he was driving in Winnie, Texas in October of 2004 when a man almost backed a car into his. He remembered the car and part of the license plate with Louisiana tags that was later made public when Coco's body was found. He later identified Burns out of the lineup as the driver of that car. In court, Detective Dryden also said that he believes Coco was killed at her home in Alexandria, asphyxiated with a pillow, her body wrapped in a comforter, and later dumped over in Texas. That comforter was never found, but Dryden said he came to that conclusion through the statements provided by people who claim Burns confessed to them. Judge Mary Doggett denied the move to reduce his bond to $50,000, citing his criminal record, Dryden's testimony, and the grand jury indictment. It's going to stay at $500,000 for second-degree murder. He's set to be back in court in August. Okay. Now, let me tell you what actually happened. And I'm going to tell the story the only way I know how, y'all. But I had I had to leave the courtroom and take a shit ton of notes on my phone for like two hours so I could try to keep it straight in my head. Uh, because I actually I was surprised. And I think everybody in the courtroom was surprised that all this shit happened. So let me t- set it up for you, first of all. So we're there, and when I say we, it's me, Miss Stephanie, uh, Courtney's mama, Courtney's stepdad, who's basically her dad, raised her forever, and a super great guy, and Courtney's cousin, and uh, one of Courtney's sisters, and Courtney's aunt, all right? So we go to the courthouse for 1.30 p.m. We get there. They usher us into the courtroom. We sit on the front side to the right, and I told you about the courtroom before. It was the same courtroom. Yeah, you know, the, when you go in a courtroom, they have what I call church pews on either side. So we go all the way to the front and, and sit on the right. There's nobody else in there. The, a couple other ladies came in, and that was one of them was represented for KALB, and I think the other ones was represented for the Town Talk, which is a local paper in Alexandria. And now there are numerous deputies uh, in the courtroom, and they're spread around. There's the, the head bailiff that I told y'all about on the um, courtroom episode that I when last time I went that I kind of l- lucked into, if you will, the shit show that was that day on the other case. But he's there, and he's in in the front behind that wall to the left with another deputy. Uh, the there's two deputies in the back of the courtroom behind us and another deputy standing at another door. Well, I don't know why there was no, because there was nobody else in the courtroom. First of all, y'all, I mean, it was open to the public, but nobody showed up. Nobody from David Anthony Burns family showed up. And, you know, I told y'all that I get threats from these keyboard warriors, what they're going to do to me, et cetera. And again, bitches, I'm not hard to find. I told you where I was going to be at yesterday and none of your punk asses showed up either. So, Maybe they were there because of that. I don't know. But, I mean, they, they had really good security. As I always, every time I've been to Rappi's Courthouse, I, they have really good security. So the court reporter comes in and uh, maybe one of their assistants, and they're coming in just getting set up. And then um, the prosecutors come in, and it was Mr. Hugo Holland, the special prosecutor, and, and his assistant, who is a, a regular Rappi's Parish uh, assistant district attorney, and then uh, Detective Tanner Dryden came in, and y'all, that was my first time to actually meet him in person. You know, he gave me Stephanie him a hug, he shook my hand, and he went and sat in the jury box. And I told y'all in, in previous episodes when on days it's motions to press, et cetera, cops always sit up in the jury box and waiting to be called. So evidently, he had been subpoenaed to be there. And we get there, and the judge shows up. And then 
Anthony the Burns is second in command. I forget his name. Uh, his, his attorney shows up and shit, one thirty passes. And it was a little bit stuffy in the courtroom at, and more time passed. And finally, Hugo Holland looked over at Burns, and I can't remember the guy's name. Burns is second in command. It's like, you know, where's your boy at? Talking about LaCour. And he said, you know, we're all here waiting on him. Hey, ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have Hormone Harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone Harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list. All in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight. And that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey y'all, I ordered... A super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. In common, like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses, and many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. And he knew he knew the time and, and date and everything else. And the guy was like, well, I don't know. And he, and he said, well, why don't you just, uh, Hugo said this to that guy. He said, well, why don't you just handle this for us? And said, it's going to take five minutes. I mean, he said, you are a lawyer, aren't you? And I think he was kind of ribbing him a little bit, y'all. And, you know, Hugo has a strong confidence about his, his person. And But, you know, I heard the people in, in the courtroom. Uh, when I say the people in the courtroom, I mean the, the powers that be the, uh, that were going to take part in this. They were like, you know, we're going to be in and out of here in five minutes. This is it's all going to get denied. And... And what have you? And finally, Hugo said, "Well, you know, why don't you go call 
him at LaCour and see where he's at. So the guy leaves and comes back in, and, and he says, well, he, he's getting off the interstate now. He's going to be about 10 minutes late. Well, fucking personally, I find that disrespectful as fuck, that, that you know you had this court date, and you can't show the fuck up on time. Now, everybody's waiting, including the judge, and he tells you a hollering that, you know, he's another 10 minutes away. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it was longer than that, right? And he said, well, you need to tell the judge. So he goes and tells the judge, and the judge is, you know, not really happy about it. You can tell that. And that's Judge Mary Doggett, y'all. She's she's a, I'll describe her to you. I don't know. She's probably my age, but the, or, uh, maybe a little bit younger and short and small in stature, uh, brown hair, and just kind of a no-nonsense. I told you last time on the episode, I think she was more than fair. And what would happen in this case today didn't change my opinion any of her, I can assure you. So we're sitting there, we're waiting. Burns is not in the courtroom. So everybody's just waiting, kind of hanging out, hanging out. I mean, disrespectful as fuck. I mean, there's at least 20 people in this courtroom between deputies and attorneys and the judge and Detective Dryden and all, I mean, and the court reporters and, and all these people just sitting here waiting. And probably 15, 20 minutes later, the door to the side of the courtroom, y'all, where the judge and, and the attorneys come in, not the main doors, a little private door and this little private hallway out there where attorneys can meet with their clients, et cetera, slings open, bam, and in comes LaCour. And I'll describe him for you. He, he's a black male, probably maybe 30 years old, and he's got on a dark suit, and he has a long black beard, and uh, he comes in carrying his briefcase in this file, and he, he walks up to the defense table. You know, you know, prosecution would have been sitting right in front of us. The defense is over to, to the left hand, my left hand side. He walks in, slams his shit on the table, and uh, starts basically just raising hell. I mean, and, and he told the judge, he said, I need some time. I need five minutes at least with my client. I'm thinking, motherfucker, yeah, you know. You already half an hour late or more, y'all. I don't know exactly what time it was because I had my phone turned off. Uh, you know, most courthouses don't even allow you to bring it in, and I certainly don't want to get in trouble with the judge. Uh, but anyway, long story short, the judge said, what's the judge going to say? And, I mean, she said, go, okay, go go out in the hall and talk to him. So he's out there more than five minutes, and we're waiting and waiting, and then – the door finally opens, and he says, okay, Your Honor, I'm ready. And so they, they call in David Anthony Burns. Now, he comes in. He's got guards, on, uh, deputies on either side of him. He's shackled at the feet. He's shackled. Uh, his hands are shackled to his belt in front of him. He's in the standard fashion of the day for the Rapids Parish Jail, which is the orange jumpsuit. And I told y'all last time he looked like hammered dog shit. This time he looked worse, if that's possible. So they bring him in and they sit. If you, I'm facing the front of the courtroom. Hugo Hollins directly in front of me. His assistants to his right. Detective Dryden is in the jury box up to my right at a little bit of a diagonal, maybe my two o'clock. Come to the left in the courtroom. You have the court reporter and and her person, and yet the judge is behind the bench. Then you go to the left. You have LaCour, Burns' attorney, LaCour's assistant, who's a younger white male. I don't know, I mean, how young he is. It looks like a kid to me. Then you had Burns sitting on the other side of him. Behind Burns is immediately a deputy. Then there was another female. Uh, uh, she was in plain clothes. I'm assuming she's a detective or something, but she was, she's there in the corner behind him. And then another deputy, and then you have the deputy who runs that courtroom. And then on the opposite front pew are the news people that I told you about. And that's it. In the back of the courtroom is deputies. So then he comes, they call him in. And then um, once he's seated, the, the head deputy, uh, and 
I'll describe him to you. He's tall, like six foot three, probably male, um, probably in his late thirties, bald headed, shaven clean. And he said, he says, "All rise." The honorable, you know, whatever session court and honorable uh, judge Doggett presiding, and she did it again, y'all. That one, one of the only times I've ever seen it done. My, my judge Doggett turns and. And the guy says, okay, we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And we did it. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, et cetera, right? I thought that was really cool. She turns around and says, be seated. Everybody sits down. And she said, we're here today on the matter of the state of Louisiana versus David Anthony Burns for the murder of Courtney Coco. And let's get started. And here's where the fun kicks in. And y'all, I'm going to have to tell it in two parts. But you're going to get the play by play. And then then you'll get my opinion of what happened when we get done. So she says, what are we here for today? And Hugo Holland stands up and says, Your Honor, I think we can dismiss with most of this pretty fast. And he said, first of all, um, and LaCour stands up and interrupts. He said, Your Honor, I filed for a preliminary exam. And Hugo Holland says, Your Honor, there's no need for a preliminary exam because on the Louisiana Code, whatever it is, y'all, uh, that when you're indicted by a grand jury, there's no need for a preliminary exam. LaCour, Burns' attorney, was was fighting coming out the gate. He challenged that. He said, Your Honor, I, I have detectives riding subpoenaed to be here and I mean, you're not going to get a fucking preliminary exam, asshole. I mean, it's just not going to happen, period. And everybody in the world knows it. But he does what lawyers do. He put up his fight, tried to get the preliminary exam. And I told Stephanie ahead of time before court, I said, listen, they that dude is going to try to do anything he can to get the facts of this case put on the record. That's what the, the whole day was about. And so they go back and forth, and the judge is like, you know, the, the preliminary exam and uh, uh, it's not necessary because of the grand jury indictment. Well, the court says, well, Your Honor, whatever the legal term is, he said, well, I, I want it done under this. And, and Hugo Holland says, Your Honor, th that states that he can get uh, Detective Tanner Dryden's statements if we know for a fact that Dryden's not going to be here for trial. He said now... Or, or if he was going to retire or be out of the country or something like that. And LaCour's like, yeah, but I want it on the record. And and Hugh Hope challenged him back, said, no, Your Honor. And, you know, he, he, Hugh Holland said, Your Honor, I do not want to sit here and put on a mini trial all afternoon. Uh, and the, the law says what it says about preliminary exam. And the judge, being fair, she said, you know, what I told you, she said, listen to, to LaCour, she said, obviously, the detective Dryden is going to be here to te you know to testify in court, and and Lacour started arguing with her, and Hugo Allen says, "Your Honor, he this is basically he wants this criminal case. He wants Detective uh, Dryden's. He wants to depose him like it's a civil case. I mean, he said this is a criminal case. This is not a civil case. And then, anyway, so the judge tells the court." Basically, it ain't happening, Jack. All right, denied, and and for the reasons that I told y'all. Then, then um, Lacour challenges on the reading of the bill, the particulars. I think it's kind of the same thing, y'all. It falls under almost the exact same thing as a preliminary exam. But what he wants is what happened in the grand jury, which is Detective Dryden's testimony. He wants it read into the record again. Hugo Holland stands up, and I'm paraphrasing y'all, but Hugo Holland stands up and says, Your Honor, I've given him everything I have. I've given him 2,500 pages worth of, of information on this case, and, and there's no read need for the reading of the bill in particular because Detective Dryden will be here, and if there's anything else in the future that I get, I'll be sure to give it to the defense. The defense argues and just, I mean, really— I guess, I mean, I don't even really know what some of these defense attorneys think they're going to do. I mean, I, I guess they have to argue it because it's their job, but it's just fucking stupid because you know you already lost, right? And ultimately, the judge ruled against them, you know, and said what she had to say. And she's nice and being fair. 
And I mean, but there, there's heat now, right? And Hugo Holland doesn't play, and he gets up. He already knows what he's going to say in, in answer to what Lacour is doing. Lacour is just balling. He's being a uh, not balling like he's crying. He's balling like he's a street fighter, right? And we hadn't got into anything yet, and so I'm thinking it's it's about to be over because we're going to do a bond reduction in. Uh, but Lacour had said, I, "But I subpoenaed the, you know Detective Dryden to be here and." and you know, I was like, just because you subpoena somebody doesn't mean they, you know, they have to testify under these things that you asked them to be here under. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of going back and forth. They didn't tell you about that in the news. And, again, I'm paraphrasing. So I think it's just about over. Well, shit, it was just about to begin, y'all, and I didn't know it. And LaCour stands up and says, well, your honor, then I file, I file for a bond reduction. And the honor says, okay, I I'm going to hear that, and uh, which is standard, y'all. I mean, that's you know, everybody has a right to a fair and reasonable bond, period. And uh, the first thing LaCour says, she's told him to proceed. The first thing LaCour says, I call Detective Tanner Dryden to the stand, and Hugo gets up and says, Your Honor, and, and um, then they start arguing, and and he's like, LaCour says, Your Honor. It, I, you know, Detective Dryden's testimony is imperative to me, establishing that my client is not only not guilty of this crime, but he didn't have anything to do with it. But he's not a threat to society. Hugo Holland comes back, and you know he's been indicted, Your Honor, by a grand jury of his peers for the second degree murder of Courtney Coco. It, it, Detective Dryden. Testifying about it, what how's it going to help? You know, I mean, it sh shouldn't happen. And there were a lot more little snippets going back and forth between attorneys and the judge. It's kind of like a tennis match. She's going back and forth, back and forth with her head, right? And shit, to my surprise, she ultimately she says, "I'm going to allow it." She said, um, "You know, I, I, I mean, you, use some discretion." And they told the judge. I mean, this went back and forth for like five minutes, and and you know. The LaCour was like, you know, Your Honor, it's totally up to you. It's your discretion. And finally, you know, Hugo said, well, yeah, certainly it's, it's Your Honor's discretion, but it's not necessary when we're going back and forth. And so finally the judge says, I'm going to allow it. She said, I think it's it's relevant to his testimony can be relevant to the fact of me reducing Anthony Burns' bond or not. So here we go. Shows about to begin. So they called Detective Tanner Dryden to the stand, and he walks up, and I guess for, for one of the first times, they're actually able to use the witness box because um, actually the judge said that, you know, you come up here and testify, you know, since COVID is on its downhill side or whatever, however she, she worded. So Detective Dryden takes the stand, and by that I mean he's standing in the booth. He has to turn and face the, the clerk. Raise his right hand. Do you solemnly swear, swear to tell the truth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And he said he does. So he's sworn in. Have a seat. Sits down. LaCour immediately starts to crack on him. He said, okay, what's your name? Uh, Tanner Dryden. Who do you work for? Alexander Police Department. And what do you do? I'm a detective. And he said, you're a detective on my client's case. Yes, I am. And y'all, I'm paraphrasing uh, yes, I am. And he said, and then you, you arrested my client. He said, yes, I did. And he said, what what basis did you arrest him on? And I think Hugo objected. It's like, your honor, it's in the grand jury. And the judge said she would allow a little bit. And then the court changed his says, no, scratch that. He said, you, you worked this case against my client. And he said, yes. And he said, and how did you come to get this case? And he said, I inherited it. And the court said, oh, you inherited it? He said, yes, I inherited it. He said, you know, I mean, oh, he said, okay, you inherited it. I mean, I, I think I knew where he's going or what ultimately he was setting it up for. He said, so you inherited the case? He said, yes, I did. And oh, let me just describe Dryden for you. Dryden was probably early 30s, light complected, probably... Mm, 5'10", something like that, maybe 5'11", I don't know. But he's thick. He's uh, he's muscled up, real close-cut military haircut. And I noticed when they were saying the Pledge of Allegiance, 
and because I was behind him, he did have his hand over his heart because he wasn't in uniform, but his left hand was down. When, it, when you're in the military and you stand in a position of attention, they teach you how to curl your hand almost to where your fist is closed and your thumb is straight down. And so I saw that. So I, I know Tanner's military. But the, his haircut, too, it's really, really, I mean, beyond flat top. But he's he's presentable. he got a little bit of a beard and everything. Uh, he's in an APD-labeled shirt. I think it might have said detective or something on it. And then uh, basically combat pants and, and black shoes. So he asked me, says, when did you first develop my client as the suspect in this case? And he said, well, you're, he said, I didn't first develop him. He said, okay, well, when did my client first become developed as a suspect in this case? Dryden says in 2011. And the court says, okay, tell us how that happened. And Tanner kind of looked at him for a second. And, I mean, here we go, y'all. This is what LaCour wanted the whole time. He wanted the facts of the case put on the record, period. And I can tell you from experience, that's what he wanted. And he lost it on the preliminary exam, and he lost on bill of particulars. And, and, I mean, he lost it every way, but he's getting it in now, and now he's going to put it on a show. And Dryden kind of hesitated for a second, and, and, and he, was, he said, you know, detective, I asked you a question, and then Dryden said, well, he was developed um, because of an eyewitness out of Texas. And, yeah, okay, for today's episode, or I just obviously can go in two parts. For this these episodes, I'm not going to say witness's name. They said him yesterday, and they said him yesterday. It's a matter of public record. Go look it up. I'm not going to say it in case somebody wants to go out there and do something stupid to one of these witnesses or whatever. I'm not going to perpetuate that part. I might say suspect two's name because it was a, it was mentioned, but we'll get to that. But he said, okay, well, tell me ab- about your eyewitness. And I mean, this, this is the opening of the Pandora's box, y'all. And, and you could tell Tanner maybe was hoping Hugo was going to shut it down, but Hugo couldn't because the judge had already ruled. So he starts, he said, well, well I had an eyewitness that saw uh, David Burns backing out of the spot where Courtney's body was found the next morning. He doesn't give any more. So the court naturally starts to question. He said, well, you know, I mean, he said, you know, how, how far away um, from the road is the the building where her body was? And Tanner's like, I don't know, from me to you? And he said, okay. He said, uh but but how far is that in feet? And Tanner said, I don't know. And and he said, I'm guessing the approximate distance from me to you. He said, may have been a little bit further. And the court was like, Harper, he said, well, was it, what time of the night was this your witness saw him? And, and Tanner said, I, I don't have my report with me. And he said, well, if I told you it was 10 or 11 o'clock at night that your witness saw it, would that be correct? And Tanner said, I can't recall. I don't have a report in front of me. He said, if you say that, and if you're saying that that's in my report, then I guess that's correct. And the court says, well, you didn't read your report before you came to court? And, I mean, a stabbing and a knife and a wound, right? I can promise you, had Tanner had any idea that he was going to have to take the stand, he would have gone through that file with a fine-tooth comb, but he didn't. And nobody thought anything was going to happen. And, and dry, I mean, Tanner had to admit, no, I didn't. I didn't read my uh, file before I came to court, which I know how I feel about that. But So the court keeps harping, man. He's harping on this eyewitness. And he says, um, but he said, he said, well, you, your eyewitness never saw my client, did he? And Tanner said, yeah, he did. And he said, mm, no, he didn't. And Tanner said, yeah, he did. He said, well, in fact, didn't you, uh, the witness, just draw a silhouette or something of my client and, and Tanner's, or, or a sketch of my client? And Tanner was like, he had to think about it for a second. And he was like, no, he drew us like a silhouette. And he said, well, Detective Ryan, tell me about this witness. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble meal kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. 
I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but I'm going to tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, siapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something. And all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real. We've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door. So see what a difference Gava will make for your household. Right now, they're all for my listeners, a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. I mean, it, it, he never said that he saw my client. And Dryden said, yes, he did. And, and of course, said, no, he didn't. And, I mean, it's, it's going back and forth. And we're not five minutes in, right? And so he says, he's, he's hounding on, on it. He said, Did, didn't he say he only saw some facial features? And Dryden was like, he said, I'm trying to re- remember. He said, but... I think he said he saw his, his, his nose and his mouth or, or something like that. And, of course, that's what that, that means. He didn't see my client. My, my client. And Dryden said, yes, he did. And it, LaCour's like, no, he didn't. And if you see I mean, if you see someone's nose and mouth or what, however he said it, maybe in his eyes, I don't remember. But he said, if you see that, that doesn't mean you saw my client. And Dryden said, listen, man. He saw your client, and he picked him out of a photo lineup. Before he said that, then LaCour went back to the sketch thing, and and Dryden said, look, I took two reports from him. I, I took one over the phone, and I took one. He said, then I drove to Texas, and I had a six-pack. Or, y'all, that's a photo lineup where it's computer-generated. They'll take, like, your driver's license photo and put it in this program, that and that finds five other people that look just like you. And if they use face algorithms and shit now, and I've seen photo lineups where I knew who the bad guy was and I couldn't tell the people apart, right? So he's Dryden said, No, I I went over and interviewed him, showed him the photo lineup and he picked them out. And the is just going off on him. He said, Well, you know, uh, in fact, you didn't. He never picked them out. And Dryden said, yes, he did. You know, and, and, uh, and he said, well, the, I'm going to show you your report. And it, it's, he said, your honor, may I approach? Or no, he, he was questioning Tanner about his report, and Tanner couldn't couldn't remember exactly. And then he says, if, if I show you your report, will it help you refresh your memory? And Tanner said, sure, it would. And so <laughs> the court takes page six out of one of the reports, it says, Your Honor, may I approach? The judge says, yes, and takes it and gives it to Tanner. Tanner's looking at it, reading at it, and kind of looked a little perplexed. And he said, he stopped for a second. He's looking at it. He's thinking about it. He said, no, no. He said, my, this this is not the report I'm talking about. Tanner said, can you show me my uh, second report? And LaCour said, well, give me that piece of paper back. And Tanner said, no, I'm going to hold on to it. And, and LaCour says, well, I'm going to need it back. And Tanner said, I'm not planning on leaving the courtroom with it. I mean, that's how contentious it was. Y'all was going back and forth. They were fighting. And so LaCour goes and gets the other paperwork. Oh, and Tanner says, just page one, just page one. Well, LaCour already knew what Tanner was getting at. And he comes back with two pages. He said, he said I would give you page one, but there's nothing on it. This, this is the one that you want to read. And he gave it to Tanner. Tanner read it. And... Didn't look so perplexed, but I don't think he found exactly what he wanted in the reading of it. But he says, you know, you read it, and, and 
and Tanner's like, yeah, and LaCour's like, let me get my papers back, you know, and, and kind of snatches them off and the thing, like fucking Tanner's <laughs> he doesn't have it in his own file. I mean, he's just be, he's being an ass like defense attorneys do. So then he backs up and he questions and said, now in your report, does it say that your, your witness saw my client's face? And he said, it says he saw his facial features. Let me look it up real quick, y'all. I took the exact notes. He said he saw the profile of the side of his face and the nose and the mouth. But, Tanner says, and my witness is an artist. Okay? So, LaCour says, so what you're telling me is your witness did not see my client's face. He said, I'm telling you that he saw the profile and his nose and his mouth. He said, yeah, but that's not his, that's not his whole face. He can't identify somebody from nose to mouth. I'm thinking, motherfucker, uh, what else is there, right? And but then LaCour starts hitting on, he said, how fast was your witness going? And Tanner said, I don't know. Uh, uh, and he said, well, I mean, and is, is it dark out there? And Tanner said, yeah, it was dark. And he, he said, well, you don't know how fast your your, your uh, witness is going? And Tanner said, I don't know how fast he was going, but your client uh, was backing out, was pulling out of that driveway so fast that he almost hit my witness. And my witness was, uh, you know, almost saw him. And, and he said, well, how could he see him? Your report says the lights were, the witness's lights, I mean, that my client's lights were shining up against the garage. He said, my witness said his lights shined in and he saw David Burns behind the wheel. And he said, well, no, he, he of course, said, no, he didn't see him. He didn't see him. He said he saw his nose in, in his mouth or whatever, his side profile. He said, but he picked him out. Tanner says, but he picked him out of a photo lineup, and the, um, he said, yeah, but he didn't. He didn't see him. And okay, so, you know, Tanner comes back with, well, you know what? He got three of the letters off her license plate, and he was able to identify. The next day, he was able to. But once it made the news that a body had been found there, and uh, and that the car description was given. And he was able to give three of the letters on the license plate. Now, y'all, for those of you who don't know, Louisiana license plates have three letters and three numbers for every car. The truck's a little bit different. The trucks have like one letter and then a bunch of numbers. But he, this guy, oh, he said, and, and he distinctly remembers it and when it happened, because first of all, he almost got killed. You know, you're, uh, Burns almost ran him over and said, secondly, he saw his face. And third, it, it, you know, his lights were shining in the car. I'm talking about the witness lights were shining in the car to the point where he could see his face and he was able to pick him out of the photo lineup. But more importantly, he gave the first three letters of the license plate and that had not been released or whatever at that time. So... Oh, he said he, my the witness was on his way back from a festival, and he remembers it very clearly. It was that Sunday night. All right, and then he asked uh, Tanner, he said, were there any tire tracks found seen? And Tanner said, yes, they were. And he said, uh, were they able to be matched to any vehicle? And Tanner said, yes, they were matched to Courtney Coco's car. And LaCour said, well, who did that? And Tanner said, Houston PD, and y'all don't know if it was Houston PD. Or I think it was probably the um, from what David Ravelli said. It was the uh, Texas Rangers, or not Texas Rangers, the um, Texas DPS, Department of Public Safety, which is basically their troopers, their crime lab that did it. And he asked him, he said, were there any shoe prints found at the scene? And Tanner said, yes, there were one pair of shoe prints. And he said, did they come back to anything uh, to – Anyone basically, and Tanner said no. They were, I think, the, um, he said they were able to identify the shoes as Nike, maybe Air Force Ones. Y'all, I might, I might have that misquoted. They were definitely Nikes, whatever. And Tanner said that was a very popular pair of shoes at that time. Y'all, shit, I'm just getting started. I mean, I don't know how far to go today, but it's a lot, and and that you just didn't get to hear in the news. A lot. So, oh, you know, let's let's talk about this for a minute, okay? So Tanner says he inherited the case. All right. This witness, now LaCour asked him, he said, 
you know, uh, the witness, he said, what was the date on your report that you showed the photo lineup? Now check this out. And then, you know, Tanner didn't get the case. The APD didn't get the case until after Real Life Real Crime had brought national attention to it after I was on, had boots on the ground and all that. And, then I, you know, nobody said Real Life Real Crime, and I don't give a shit about that. I'm so glad this asshole is look, who looks worse than hammered to dog shit is, is in handcuffs and shackles like he needs to be. But I know where the core is going with this and when he was trying to question him about the date so basically what happened, evidently Detective Dryden did some fine police work and oh, because he asked, uh, LaCour asked me, he said, where did you get, find my, uh, your witness statement from? And and Dryden said, out of the Texas case file. So what, I, what I'm assuming y'all happened was in Tanner's review of the Texas case file, he finds where this guy called in and said, hey, I, you know, right there where that body was dumped, I saw a dude pulling out, and he almost ran me over, and I can ID him. Now, y'all, I don't know. I haven't called uh, Detective Ravelli yet on this, and I meant to do it earlier. But a lot of times, especially in homicide investigations, you are, you are looking at so many different things, and you have all these tips and calls coming in. I mean, the, the anybody would want to know why in the fuck wasn't this guy showing a, a photo lineup back then? That's where what LaCour was getting at, and I mean, and rightfully so. I can only tell you from experience that there's so much stuff going on that you just don't, yeah, I mean, coming back all the years later like I do in cold cases, it's not really fair to the guys that work the cases and, and because you're playing armchair quarterback and you have the ability of not having the stress. I mean, you got the stress of the case on you, but you have the ability of not uh, being under the pressure from the news and the family and everything else right at the moment when the, when the death happened or the murder happened and you discovered a body. So I don't know, but it's going to come out in trial that, that when this witness – uh, and y'all, they gave his name, and I'm not giving it. When this witness first called it in, and evidently it was in the Texas case file, so it evidently happened way back then. I don't know. So, but Dryden saying he inherited the case. Well, you remember they were going around telling everybody, and this comes up later in this court proceeding, in which I'm, I'm gonna have to continue uh, that she was died of an accidental overdose. It was a cold. It was a frozen case until it wasn't right and until Dryden actually started working it uh, after we brought the attention to it, after I had the boots on the ground. So I'll give Rabelais on that and, and let y'all know because I, I don't know why I didn't think about it ahead of time, but that's where it starts at. And I'll, I'll continue just a couple more minutes. Then I'm kind of skipping around, but at one point LaCour says, so in 2011, my client, first came on the radar as a possible suspect. And Dryden said, yeah. And he said, well, what, what happened then? He, and Dryden said, the witnesses, or a, a witness, a person came forward in 2011 and gave a statement saying that Anthony Burns murdered Courtney Coco, that Anthony Burns told him he murdered Courtney Coco, and LaCour's all over it. Naturally, LaCour's like, well, why didn't, you know, why didn't they go after him then? And blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and Dryden said they evidently didn't feel at that time that was enough information to act upon and certainly not enough information to arrest your client. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to leave it at, at that for this week, y'all. Uh, we'll continue on. This is important. I, I played the, the news reel for you. I mean, so you know the basics of what happened. But you don't know everything that happened, and they where this guy got exactly what he wanted. He got to get the majority of the evidence out on the record, okay? And it, you know, stay tuned for next week because personally, if you didn't know, if you were sitting in a courtroom and you didn't know how these things work, you might have thought, "Oh shit!" For Courtney Coco at, at the end, end of Lacour's deal, but. We'll get to that starting on next week. But there was a lot of uh, chess match going back and forth. And on this case, where normally the defense has a free shot on the preliminary exam, et cetera, like that, to get this evidence out, finally 
the judge grants it, and they're hearing it through the motion for the bond reduction. But I, where I think, I personally think, from my experience, that LaCour and, and the defense screwed up. And I'm going to tell you about all the stuff, and I'll, I'll, I'll continue next time. Or I think they really screwed up is instead of the prosecution showing their whole hand because of the defense getting to do it on their preliminary exam, I th- can tell you that the defense questioned or tried to punch a hole in every theory in the case. And what, what am I telling you? I'm telling you, I think the defense tipped their fucking hand yesterday, and I don't think that bodes well for them because I can tell you one thing, Hugo Holland and them and Detective Dryden and them, if they were surprised by anything the defense brought up, and they brought up a lot of shit, y'all, and, and we'll get into it. But if they were surprised, a lot of shit that didn't make the news tons. But I think I think the defense fucked up because I think they fired all of the bullets in their weapon, right? And now they're standing there with an empty gun. The I'll tell you about the, the uh, Hugo Holland prosecution's you know responses and everything next week. But at the end of the day, the one thing that didn't happen is I know I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the prosecution did not have, or the defense did not get everything out of the prosecution, and the prosecution didn't have to testify to shit. Uh, all they had to do was defend all these different theories and, and shit that uh, LaCour brought up. But anyway, that's it. I'm not going to take any more of your time today. Stay tuned. I know this is long going to be long, y'all, but I will not do this story just if, if I don't tell it as I saw it unfold. And I'm not saying that every word is correct and shit like that, but the overall theme is definitely correct. When I left, I took the notes for like two hours just so I wouldn't forget anything because, look, I was surprised. And, and, and it, Stephanie was surprised. Stephanie ended up taking a, a um, envelope out of her purse and, and writing on the back of the envelope, taking notes in the courtroom, right? And, man, I wanted to turn my phone on and, and hit record, but, you know, I, I respect the, the, the judge and, and, the, and the, uh, the courtroom enough not to take that chance and not to break that rule. But, anyway... Stay tuned. Really, really just getting into it. Uh, You have no idea. So I'm going to conclude for today. Courtney Coco's courtroom coverage. All right. So um, advertisers, y'all. Look, if you own a business and you want me to promote you, you want to sponsor Real Life Real Crime, email Cindy. It's C-Y-N-D-I. Cindy at real life real crime.com i do it for, for all these big national companies y'all and i want to do it for you give us a shot let me show you what we can do so barbara blunt's case y'all please continue to send in your tips and we're doing a hashtag justice for barbara blunt just like we do the hashtag justice for courtney coco and we are Toby Tom Play and I will be starting Don't Call It a Cold Case and where we're gonna cover the uh the big show production on Miss Barbara Blunt to get it more attention and then we'll start looking at some of these other cold cases. Y'all again, crew bash tickets, go to eventbrite.com, forty bucks a piece, and you're gonna have a blast. Texas Club, June nineteenth, it will be when you hear this, regular lifers hear this, not Patreon, because y'all get a commercial free and early, but when regular lifers hear this, there will be less than seven days to the biggest party of the year, all right? So you heard me talk about it in the beginning. Throw it out there again, but more importantly, I want to throw out Lope and, and Captain Calvin Duvall, Duvall's Cajun Charters, Delacro, Louisiana. Y'all look him up. He's got a website. He's on Facebook. He kicks ass. I'm going fishing with him next week with some lifers that are coming in from Colorado, and I'm fired up about that. So we'll, we'll post some pictures and everything about that. But, but he donated the trip for Lopa, and RLRC is donating the room to the winner, and Jim Chavin, local leaders, donating 125 quart Yeti, and the second place prize, Ms. Uh, Tiffany's card and Home Key Mortgage, are donating another 125 quart Yeti to this raffle. Y'all go to realliferealcrime.com and buy your tickets, $15. For one or a book of 10 for 100. And shit, it's, it's thousands of dollars worth of prizes, but 
you, you cannot put a price tag on the experience that we're going to have down in the marshes of South Louisiana the night before and, and the day of. So y'all go do it. And all proceeds go to LOPA. You know how I feel about LOPA. And I want to thank all you life for, for supporting us. If you can't be a patron member, I totally get it. And I love you, love you, love you anyway. Just please keep continuing and sharing um, and liking us and helping me grow. And we're doing great things, y'all, doing great things. So stay tuned. I mean, it's all because of y'all and patron members. You know I couldn't do the show without you. Thank you for your support. And I'm going to keep on trying to give you uh, the most benefits we can, including another bonus episode coming up next week. So if you are a listener in Saskatchewan and you want to be an organ donor, go to Lopa dot org and sign up you don't have to be from louisiana but go to lopa.org and sign up be an organ donor give the gift of life be a hero and i'm woody overton you host a real life real crime the podcast and until next time or ever don't let me catch you down on murder by you peace <laughs> Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Templey.